Mr. Jamie Dornan is here. There he is. How are you, sir? How nice to see you. Always a pleasure. Can I tell you something? We were just chatting before in the break, before we came, and I, and I feel I should tell you, because I feel it in my core, I was shocked within myself how overjoyed I was just to see you and talk to you. There you go. That's just from me to you. But that's the nicest thing ever said to me, I think. Well, I, I absolutely mean it. Now, how, where are you? You're back in the UK. How are you doing? How are you holding up? Uh, doing OK, mate. Yeah, back in the UK, you know, in the Cotswolds, so it's a couple of hours outside London. And we're, you know, like everyone, it's, it was a bit of a shock at the beginning of all this. And then, you know, you adapt. And, and the whole thing about the Cotswolds is where we live in the countryside. Nothing really happens anyway. Yeah. So there's no, like, you don't have that FOMO that you do if you're, like, in LA or London or New York and you're missing out on all this stuff because we sort of miss out on everything by living here. Yeah, you're right. You turn on the local news in the Cotswolds and it's like, breaking news, they still haven't moved that car. <laughs> <laughs> but you're looking very well on it. I mean, I don't know if many people know this, but you were, you were a very successful model when you were in your early 20s. Were you ever worried? Were you ever... Because it's one thing I feel very blessed in, that I don't have to worry about protecting the moneymaker in any way. Is that a thing when you're a model where you're like, I must protect the face at all costs? Um, you would think that, but I, I wasn't very good at that either. I mean, I broke, I broke my nose three times. I think twice was while I was, uh, while I was modelling. Once I was still playing a bit of rugby, and uh, you know, ended up at the bottom of a rock, and a few heavier men than me landed on my face. And then another time, I got headbutted. I got my my, my someone broke my nose by headbutting me in a in a in a nightclub in, in Clapham in South London. <laughs> Why? What happened? Who would dare headbutt Jamie Dornan? You know. Um, it was one of those situations where someone just didn't like the look of me. You know, it was kind of like uh, I was just getting weird vibes from some guy uh, on the side of the dance floor. And I think I was like dancing with like a few mates or whatever pretty badly, I'd imagine. And he came up and was just like in my face and saying, like saying, what are you looking at? And stuff. And I was like, I'm not, wasn't looking at you. I don't know what you're talking about. And then he was right up my face. And I had seen that morning on uh, Des and Mel, Melanie Sykes, Des O'Connor, yes. God rest his soul. Um, they had that show together, and I'd noticed that morning that it was National Courtesy Day. Right. Um, I, whatever, you know, every day is National Something Day, but this was National Courtesy Day. And so this guy's like right up in my face on this dance floor, like really screaming and swearing in my face. And I was going, like, mate, you're not allowed to swear. It's National Courtesy Day. I'm so sorry. You can't be <laughs> swearing in my face. And, you know, that just, he didn't like that, obviously. And um, I was sort of thinking, like, if this comes to blows, I sort of back myself, like, I've got time to move. But you don't, no one reckons for a hair, uh, for a headbutt, you know, no. so suddenly you just poof, and that was it, nose uh, exploded, and yeah, terrible. Wow. Yeah, and the craziest thing was about two weeks later, I had this shoot for Calvin Klein uh, that I sort of like hadn't reckoned, and then I, I got my, uh, my nose broken, and I still had like black eyes and stuff, and I had to like cover up like makeup all over my eyes because I still had this broken nose. So, yeah, not ideal. See, that's why I've never been able to model for Calvin Klein. <laughs> that is because yeah. I just get... You know me, Guillermo, you get me out a few drinks, I just get in too many rucks, you know? <laughs> that's me. I'm just... I love a ruck. I love a carve-up. Smash. Um, <laughs> now, Jamie, Christmas... Christmas is around the corner. Yep. And I didn't know this, but you won a drama prize for playing Widow Twanky in a school mm -hmm. pantomime. Now, Americans won't know what that was. Explain to an American viewer who Widow Twanky is and what you remember about this award-winning performance. Well, I remember it fondly because it, it was only um, academic. It wasn't even academic. It was a drama prize, but it was the only prize outside of sport that I ever got at school. Um, and I was, think I was 10 or 11 years old. And Widow Twanky, so we were doing Aladdin, was the, the school play. And Widow Twanky is only appears in the uh, pantomime version of, of Aladdin. And I, she's always in drag, you know, it's always a guy dressed as a woman, yeah. famously as Widow Twanky. I can't really remember what she does, but I sort of based her. We had a, a, a sort of cleaning lady who worked for us at the time called Nellie, who uh, back in Belfast, and she, um, she was the basis for my entire <laughs> performance. I just like copied her every, every movement and, um, you know, it's a lot of that uh, for America's pantomime. It's a, it's that whole. Uh, he's behind you. What? Yeah. Oh, oh no, he didn't. That it's, it's very strange. It is a strange thing when you think about it. Uh, it happens every Christmas. So, but it was my finest moment in my career. 
It's strange, but it's glorious. Is there any, is there any video evidence of such a performance? Mate, I would be, I, it, this was like 1992. So this is oh, kind so of be like a before VHS. everybody filmed. Yeah. Exactly. And I just, you know, I know it was made though, because I remember, you know, they did, they had like a camera set up and one, they, one person did it. It was all sent out to all the parents or whatever. So it does exist, but I've never seen it. Well, it does exist. And don't we've it. managed to track it <laughs> down. I'm joking, we couldn't find it, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I was so excited. <laughs> now let's talk about your new movie, Wild Mountain Time. It's, it's a beautiful, it feels like a throwback in many ways, a real old fashioned love story. But your real love story with your wife is, is already like something out of a film. Uh, tell me the story of how you met your wife and then how you came to you know, propose. Yeah, we were in LA, actually. Um, I was there, you know, sort of bumming around, probably doing pilot season or something and not really getting anywhere. This was uh, 10, 11 years ago now. And um, I was actually in Koreatown doing karaoke with Eddie Redmayne and a couple of other lads. Um, uh, having a boys night, you know, doing karaoke in Koreatown. <laughs> and... Um, and uh, I, I, my, my wife is a film composer now. She, she did the music for Wild Mountain Time. She, she did the score. Um, but back then, and before then, she'd been an actor. So I knew who she was as an actress. I'd always fancied her. And we were doing karaoke, and someone came in, a friend of ours, and said, listen, Amelia Warner's at a house party up, up, uh, up in uh, uh, Los Feliz, and uh, she's single. And I, I literally dropped the mic and was like, you know, ran, ran for the hills. And... Uh, we met and we instantly got on great and chatted all night and she was sat on the step uh, at our friend's house. And I, they're not my friends, by the way. They became very good friends. But at that time, I didn't know them. I just rocked up at this house. And um, and then, you know, two and a half, three years later, I proposed to her on the very steps that we that we met, which was... Uh, oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. See, I do feel like that could be a glorious <laughs> short in itself. But let's talk about the movie. For anyone who doesn't know, tell them what it's about and who you play. So it's uh, called Wild Mountain Time. I, myself and Emily Blunt, uh, John Hamm, Christopher Walken. Uh, Emily and I play these sort of quite odd um, Irish farmers who um, Emily's character, Rosemary, has been sort of pining for Anthony, my character, her whole life. And he's just never been able to recognize that the woman that uh, he will love is right in front of him the whole time. It's, it's very classic and it's... Um, uh, storytelling, it sort of is, as you say, it's like a throwback. It's like a sort of movies that aren't made anymore. It's like very old school romantic, you know, um, a romance, basically. John Patrick Shanley wrote and directed it, who wrote Moonstruck, uh, yeah. who wrote The Great Doubt, who did, uh, you know, Joe versus a Volcano. He's made a lot of very interesting, quirky films and, uh, you know, Pulitzer Prize, Academy Award, Tony Award winning writer. He's an incredible way with words. So a real joy to be able to, to speak to him. Well, the film's so good, and you are, as, as ever, so brilliant in it. Now, Jamie, we've been doing this thing on the show uh, called A Late Late Show and Tell, where we ask our guests to share something with us from their home that we may otherwise never get to see. Do you have something you'd like to share with us this evening? Funnily enough, I do. And um, I'm going to share something. It is from my home, but it, I also have it at all times. It's from, in my wallet, my real wallet. Um, so this is... Um, Elvis Presley, uh, that's, a, that's a fake driving license. Um, so my wife and I, for our honeymoon, we drove across America from San Francisco to New York, took five weeks, did the sort of Southern route. Um, I don't believe, I'm, I'm a massive Elvis fan, my whole family are. So we're like, obviously we were in Memphis, went to Graceland and I, I bought this in like, the, you know, the, the sort of, um, the, 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 the store, the, um, uh, what's it called, the gift shop. And um, and then we were about a day later, we were still in Tennessee and we stopped somewhere to buy booze, right? And I went in and I was buying the booze and my wife and I were there and, and the woman said, ID, and uh, do you have identification? And I said, yeah. And I, I went to get my real driving license out and I saw that and I went, oh, I'm not sure of this. And I, I showed her Elvis Presley, right? Uh, and look, bearing in mind, that's the most famous person maybe ever, to ever in, in the world ever. Yeah. We're in Tennessee. It says he was born in 1935. <laughs> and honestly, she, she stood, 
she stood <laughs> sat there looking at looking at me, looking at that, back to me, back to that oh, for what felt like ten minutes, to the point that I was like, uh, "It's Elvis Presley." Uh, that's like Elvis Presley. Okay, listen, here's my own, and just had to like break her out of her, her misery and the, the awkwardness of the situation. It was absurd. Um, yeah, so there we go. That's my uh, Elvis Presley thing. I take that as a huge compliment. I really, really would. That's that's the nicest compliment anyone can ever play you. I wasn't sure if it was you or a young Elvis Presley. That's incredible. Reggie, do you have a question for our guest this evening? Uh, yes, I do. Tonight's question goes to... Let's make it for our current guest. If pancakes were real, how successful do you think they would be? Ah, uh, wow, well, that is a really good question. <laughs> and I feel like they would be, you know, maybe not presidential, but certainly Congress. They'd be Congress levels of success. Is that right, Reg? That's correct. It's absolutely mm. correct. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank the incredible Jamie Dornan, everybody.